you see tweets coming in uh, to the Department of Homeland Security you, uh, where a conservative says, you know, don't trust, this is in the 2020 election, don't trust, uh, vote by mail. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way for our votes to get lost. Please vote in person. Our, the, the election's going to be rigged. Those tweets were getting deleted. Then you'd see Twitter officials looking at content wise essentially the, the identical message from Eric Holder you know mm-hmm. former attorney general under Obama saying don't trust vote by mail Trump controls the post office vote in person so in in, in terms of the content of the message basically the exact same thing mm-hmm. and Twitter officials deciding to censor or throttle only the conservatives not the Democrats I, I, I found emails that not only confirmed Twitter's participation in this Pentagon CENTCOM influence operation, but actually showed so much more. Twitter executives were meeting with the Pentagon and uh, creating a, a special uh, bot, and they created a blue, an invisible blue check for their network of account. They could post NSFW content without being flagged as spam. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Lee Fong. Lee Fong is an investigative reporter formerly of The Intercept and The Nation. His writing is focused on the influence of money in politics, security state overreach, and civil liberties. He was also responsible for releasing part of the Twitter files many months ago. In this episode, we talk about the wide breadth of Lee's work, including his early reporting about the Koch brothers. We talk about whether there is a deep state We talk about the collusion between Twitter and the U.S. security state that was revealed in the Twitter files, and much more. So without further ado, Lee Fong. Lee Fong, thanks so much for coming on my show. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, let's start out just by getting a bit about you and your background and how you got into investigative journalism. You, You were... People may know you from your work at The Intercept for about eight years, and more recently, you started a Substack, and we'll get into all of that, but how did you actually get into investigative journalism? Well, I've always been interested in media and politics. You know, I grew up in the D.C. area, kind of a morning ritual was reading the Washington Post uh, with breakfast and watching 2020 and 60 Minutes every week. Uh, I was really shaped also by the events around September 11th, you know, I, my father and I went and, you know, we were doing some kind of volunteer work and coincidentally it was in Northern Virginia. And we later that day we saw, um, you know, the pillars of smoke coming out of the Pentagon Mm. and just following along with the war in Iraq and, you know, the war on terror and the kind of evangelical religious undertones of the 2004 presidential race, really kind of shaped me. I went to a lot of protests, uh, given the proximity to DC. Mm. Um, I was into kind of like punk rock music that has like a a political, I don't know, angle to it that brings people out to protest, I suppose. Your brother's a drummer. Yeah. In a punk rock band? Yeah. Uh, punk hardcore, uh, turnstile. Yeah. And you know, we were both, we're both really big into this music into our adolescence. He just kind of kept (laughs) into adulthood. Yeah. Uh, and made a profession out of it. But, you know, this kind of, this was my first kind of entry point to to politics, uh, just this kind of milieu. And I felt uncomfortable kind of with the protest dynamic. Um, you know, it, it felt like if you actually saw Bush as an authoritarian or you really wanted to end the war in Iraq, chanting and sloganeering, you know, outside in the streets only did so much. And if any... Things sometimes it actually might have undermined uh, that effort. So how so? It, you know, if if you're if the goal is to persuade, if you if we live in a democracy, if the goal is to persuade your fellow Americans not to support a certain policy. You got to have um, a message and a strategy that brings them to your point of view. Mm-hmm. And I'm and I think some of these um, far left protests. You know, some of them were effective, but many of them were kind of just this ritualistic thing that left wing people engage in, mm-hmm. not caring if it actually persuades people or wins elections, um, you know, how you actually affect you, affect change in, in a democracy. And so I, I just kind of 
I, I felt a little bit turned off by some of these protest groups. I, I went into, I, I interned at a lot of different political organizations. I started interning at media outlets. I just really enjoyed kind of reading the blossoming blogosphere or whatever you mm-hmm. call it. Uh, that was big in kind of 2005, 2006. And um, I, I found a job eventually coming out of college at the Center for American Progress, mm-hmm. working as uh, a blogger there, um, you know, kind of the polar opposite of the punk world where it's super establishment. This is a think tank tied to the Obama administration. Um, Was that a weird identity moment for you to straddle the world between punk rock culture and think tank culture? Well, you know, I just, I feel like there's a transgressive side to me that, you know, I want to question authority mm-hmm. and I want to, but I, I want to also contribute to the public interest. I want to make the world a better place with my journalism. And, you know, there were a lot of benefits to that job. I really enjoyed it in a lot of ways. But it also, I was the kind of odd man out there. I was kind of seen as the extremist, the Mm -hmm. extreme left winger Mm -hmm. there. And there was was a lot of tension because, you know, while I was working as a journalist there, you know, there were attempts to censor over partisan reasons, not to criticize the Democratic Party, a lot of corporate donors. Uh, to cap. Not to criticize the Democratic Party in um, like 2006. This is 2008, 9, 10, uh, okay. 11. And, you know, it got to a point where, you know, it was kind of intolerable where, you know, uh, this was as kind of the Occupy Wall Street movement was taking off and Obama had, had lost big in the midterms and he was going into this defensive crouch where he was cutting deals to um, cut, you know, cut spending and potentially even put entitlement cuts on the table to cut Medicare and Social Security, these kind of bedrock uh, social programs. And I I was just kind of disgusted with the whole thing and and left, started a little anti-corruption blog, pissed off all my donors there, was back out uh, solo, kind of drifting toward, you know, back and forth uh, between different magazines and online sites, Mm -hmm. and eventually landed in 2015 at the intercept which in the beginning was 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 great because it was this place where you know it was flush with money um this billionaire pierre omidyar had granted a, a lot of money to it you know it had this kind of you know adversarial mindset if we we're going to take on the world you know they they had, this, these were the journalists who had broken the snowden um classified document showing mass surveillance by the government uh their whole mission was to challenge you know, centers of power and, and to ask big questions that the other media outlets were not doing. Mm-hmm. And so it was very exciting. And, you know, that was kind of my path. I, I had worked in lefty journalism and establishment kind of center left journalism. And then I ended up at, at the intercept where, you know, it, it, it's, it was, it was great in the beginning. Yeah. So it's interesting. You have, um, were there any formative thinkers or writers in your youth that really shaped your worldview and gave you this, um, what I see as a, a really a, a burning desire to expose corruption, to hold the security state accountable, which is kind of the through line of of all your work. Yeah. Right? Were there any formative people that had a big influence on you? You know, I enjoy reading all kinds of different investigative reporters throughout the 20th century, um, you know, and just like uh, there's a lot of contemporary writers you know, I was reading a lot of Harper's in college. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Ken Silverstein, really great uh, writing there and, and in other places. I liked Glenn Greenwald uh, as a blogger, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and later he, he, he became a colleague. Uh, you know, th- there are many others, but it's, it's not, I don't think there was one person that I kind of held up as an idol, no. Mm-hmm. So you were at The Intercept for... Eight years, and uh, you you left about um, a month ago, and now you you have a great Substack, which I would point all my listeners to. Uh, do you have a title for that Substack, or just your name? Yeah, it's just LeeFong.com. I shout out for the domain. There's a Korean cyber squatter on it, so it costs me a little bit. So uh, there's also a Lee Fong that writes about music on Substack. I think. Oh really? Yeah. Or, there's or, or maybe I have a SoundCloud. I have a name Google alert for my name, and it's like it's me. Writing about corruption, and then often a lot of Malaysian teens. Huh. So I, I see those. There's there's some other Lee Fongs out there, but LeeFong.com is is my subset. Yeah, and you have a lot of great stories there. Um, so I recommend that to people. But 
you know, I, I know that there over your years at the Intercept, there was an increasing rift between some of your views and the the views of colleagues, right? And obviously, what would unite people at the Intercept, which uh, you know, and people can go back listen to my my episode with Glenn Greenwald and, and, and Brianna Joy Gray, other people that have written at the Intercept. What I see as uniting the that culture is this desire to hold the U.S. security state accountable and a sense that other media outlets don't do such a good job of that or don't do it nearly as zealously as perhaps they should. Um, lots of stories about FBI overreach, sure. um, FBI you know, involvement with private corporations, um, things of that nature. So you were very much in the ethos of The Intercept with respect to that issue. But with respect to other issues on identity and race and policing, it seems there was a rift at some point between you and The Intercept. Can you describe that? Yeah, I think there's been some very public rifts over the years. And even with the FBI, it kind of, there's there's a rift, you know? Mm. Um, and, it, and I think a lot of it comes down to a few things. Uh, the Trump election in 2016, mm-hmm. I think permanently severed. Um, a lot of that that ethos that you're talking about, um, in, because in it, it, it heightened a sense of partisanship. Mm. You, you know, and rather than looking at these issues as a as a principled power thing, you know, looking at corporate power or um, you know security state power, there is a tendency to see, oh, okay, if anything that's any kind of journalism that could be perceived as friendly to the wrong people, mm. friendly to the wrong ideological stripe or you know Republican party. Um, that's not journalism that we want to be associated with. We're very scared of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, it, it comes, in, which, you know, touches on the security state aspect because, you know, uh, obviously I don't need to do a lot of throat clearing around this, but obviously January 6th was a riot. You know, the, people did do dangerous, harmful things in that in that protest. Uh, there were, it looks like, a, a few individuals that really wanted to, really had a, a dangerous agenda mm-hmm. but generally speaking you know it there's you know you look at this protest the fbi was gathering you know google facebook they were sucking in uh data from tons of different apps for people who were at that protest and it wasn't clear if they're you know a, a dangerous threat to the republic you know mm-hmm. um they're tracking these people down all over the country um if this i just kind of when i look at any of these issues that the intercept or other media outlets explore you know, it, I I wonder what would happen if it was done by the other side, mm-hmm. right? Like if um you know the election had gone another way, and you saw left wing protesters trespassing on the Capitol grounds, would you want the FBI for every single one of those participants, no matter how low level, no matter how n- nonviolent, to be sucking up the data from all of their phones, and to be you know sending agents across, fanning across the country to arrest and 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 to you know charge them with with felonies? It's like I kind of don't think so. You know, I think yeah. this was seen through a partisan light where, you know, this type of security state overreach um, was kind of ignored because it went off, went after the right targets. Mm-hmm. Um, the other kind of big rift, I, I suppose, with The Intercept is that, you know, I'm, I'm uh, for lack of a better term, I guess I'm, I'm a humanist. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very kind of skeptical of racial identity politics and other forms of tribalism. I think mm-hmm. they're like a form... Of, uh, it's a construct that's used to divide people and, and make them hate each other, uh, used by the left and the right, although more, potentially more by the left in recent years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, there are people on the left um, at outlets, not just at The Intercept, of course, at many outlets and NGOs and academia and, and beyond, that uh, view identity politics as kind of like a, a, a sacred strategy that uh is the only way to the, to push this country forward so you know there's, there's a fundamental division here where you know i i feel uncomfortable with categorizing and stereotyping people as inherently privileged or inherently oppressed based on race or you know just any type of stereotyping at all based on race and there are many people on the left that uh don't take this view and it's led to some clashes uh at the intercept yeah what it uh what stands out to me there is it seems like you have been a principled anti-corruption uh, 
skeptical of security state journalist since the the aughts. And at that point, the main nexus for that issue was the war in Iraq and the NSA and the overreach in that department. But the in some way, the main nexus of that more recently has been other issues, um, you know, such as the the Twitter files, which you reported on, and the the sort of cooperation between the security state and Twitter in promoting, um, you know, social media influence campaigns for the the U.S. state abroad and all of that. And it seems like you have remained pretty much the same in your principles while the wider public around this issue has proved less principled about the issue. So, for example, many, many of the same people that would have loved your reporting on the Tea Party and Bush era might not like some of the stuff you have to say about the Biden administration, for example. And many people that would love the anti-corruption stuff, if it were targeting, say, like a rich white billionaire, would not like the anti-corruption stuff if it targets, uh, like, for example, you you have some recent stories about Faith Batista, for example, who is a pro-identity politics, um, Asian diversity sort of representative. And so it seems like you just stay principled across the board. And so you're in a kind of precarious spot as a journalist, which is people get so sucked in to identity politics and to partisan politics on either side and they can become friends with you and maybe love your work for a few years but then inevitably when the tide turns they're going to see you as a traitor right so in, in some way your career has been you know a series of betraying <laughs> people that are unprincipled about corruption yeah i mean just as a journalist an investigative journalist who, especially as a generalist who just writes about all kinds of issues you know i've, I've un intentionally burned a lot of bridges mm -hmm. um you know uh i, I want to maintain interpersonal relationships when i can but you know i don't i don't want that to get in the way of my writing uh yeah but you know the department of homeland security and fbi are just like it's just if, if you imagine a lot of the of what was uncovered with the twitter files and even before that i was writing about these issues around the DHS partnership with the social media companies to censor based on, you know, allegations of disinformation, misinformation, malinformation. Uh, yeah, by the way, the malinformation, that's the funniest. Yeah, that's the word I have not heard until I read your Substack. Yeah, that, it's, it's uh, true information that's like problematic or used in, in a bad yeah. context. It's yeah. like, right. all right, so basically politics, I don't know. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, this is a great example of something that, you know, if this was, if the DHS was doing this under Bush, you know, and we're applying it in, in a similar way, uh, you know, you, you could see liberals being apoplectic, mm -hmm. you know, uh, going to war on this. You, you look at the actual content being censored, and, uh, you know, it, you, you see tweets coming in uh, to the Department of Homeland Security you, uh, where, a conservative says, you know, don't trust, this is in the 2020 election, don't trust, uh, vote by mail, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a way for our votes to get lost, please vote in person, um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the election's going to be rigged, mm -hmm. you know, I'm concerned about that. Those tweets were getting deleted, then you'd see Twitter officials looking at, content-wise, essentially the, the identical message from Eric Holder. You know, mm -hmm. former attorney general under Obama, or Howard Dean, former chairman of the DNC, saying, "Don't trust vote by mail. Trump controls the post office. Vote in person." So, in 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 terms of the content of the message, basically the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And Twitter officials deciding to censor or throttle only the conservatives, not the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And then post election, a lot of Republicans saying it was rigged, it was unfair. You know, censoring that is dangerous misinformation you know look look back at any election in the 2004 election one of the big you know s stories coming out of that was that the ohio election was was rigged that they had used voting that the, that they that state had used voting machines owned by a bush donor mm -hmm. that you couldn't trust the results you know you didn't see the department of homeland security censoring any website that published that type of allegation or you know newspaper or, or radio show but in 2020 you did see this kind of partisan attempt 
to censor some of this. And of course, you know, Bush, uh, Trump was president then, um, but you know, it, it, this was a, a an agency that was kind of acting on its own. Um, they were partnering with this think tank in Stanford that had a relationship only with the DNC and not with the RNC. Um, there were a lot of issues there. And, you know, th- there were other kind of backdoor channels for some partisan influence. We don't have to get into all of that right now. But mm-hmm. it's just it's just incredible to me because it doesn't take that long of a memory to think about really identical claims being made about elections not that long ago by Democrats. But now that Republicans are making them, fairly or not, I think, you know, obviously there a lot there were a lot of after any election, you see a lot of hyperbolic claims from the losing side. Mm-hmm. You did see a lot of that, a lot of untrue claims. But is that a case for mass censorship you know, and by a government agency nudging, the, nudging it along? I don't think so. Yeah. So um, this comes to the question that was debated a lot when the Twitter files were released in December, began to be released. It, does Twitter have a left-wing bias to its censorship? Now, what I mean by that is, is is it the case that the censors at Twitter in the pre-Elon or, you know, Elon era have put their thumb on the scales against conservative intellectuals, writers, et cetera, or have they censored more or less even handedly? My own position on that is it's it's always been pretty clear to me that it was more censorship of right wing voices than left wing voices. And I don't think it's intentional necessarily. I just think it's the the culture of Twitter is is going to be a liberal culture given that it's a Silicon Valley company. And what appears even-handed to a liberal audience is almost by definition a liberal bias in the same way that if, if you have all conservatives working at an institute, like if you ask the NRA to be really perfectly fair in their censorship – I have no doubt that there would be a right-wing skew as well. But to be fair to the other side, I think, you know, Barry Weiss released, I think, the second tranche of the Twitter files, and I don't think there was a systematic accounting of whether they had censored more left or more right. So perhaps reasonable people could disagree, but what is your perception of this? I I, I generally share that that view. You know, I was at the Twitter headquarters looking at, emails for about four or five days. So mm-hmm. I, I can't say anything sweeping with just looking at anecdotal evidence. Mm-hmm. But from the public reporting that's been done and the anecdotal evidence that I've seen, you know, it's skewed it's skewed left. And, you know, I don't have like a grand theory of why, but generally it seems like these employees who are making the decision were generally on the left. And so they generally had a left wing predisposition to censor, you know, certain topics. Um, based on that bias, you know, I, I, I don't I don't see it as like a grand partisan conspiracy that they were attempting to shift this the scales as some part part of some broader culture war per se, mm-hmm. but it, as rather a natural outgrowth of who they were and who they selected to be on these trust and safety councils. You know, when you stack it with left leaning groups, you're going to get left wing bias. Right. Okay, so let's talk about your. Uh, Twitter files tranche, which was, I think, number eight or number eight and nine. Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, some of yeah. So um, how did how did Twitter get in touch with you at the beginning? And how did they why do you think they selected you to be to be one of the people to release part of the Twitter files? That's a, a great question. Um, I guess I haven't really talked about this publicly, but I'll just say they didn't. They didn't select me. I just yeah. saw that, you know, Michael Schellenberger Barry Weiss, Matt Taibbi, all of whom I enjoy their writing and count them as friends, were here in San Francisco doing the Twitter files, and I just kind of harassed them <laughs> privately to let me in and let me join them. Nice. Um, just as a reporter, I'm like, this is a great opportunity. I've, I've, I've worked on hacked and leaked documents my entire life. I've written dozens of stories based on various kind of unintentional disclosures of documents. This is one of the weirdest ones where you have like the CEO of a company inviting you in to, to look at things. And uh, just through constant lobbying, they let me in. I'm not even sure if Twitter knew I was there the first few days, like the third or fourth <laughs> day I signed in. Um, so yeah, I just, I got in. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. And what did you discover? Well, you know, it, this worked out perfectly because you know, I just as a reporter, I, I start like tons of stories and I don't finish 
like half of them, you know, so I've got tons of drafts of stories that, you know, I, I, that I, I'm interested in that I might have a few documents or interviews around, but it's like, it's not a hundred percent there mm-hmm. yet. And this was a story that I had started the previous summer. You know, there had been some public reporting that the Pentagon had created its own gigantic network of fake news sites uh, and fake accounts on various social networks to push the U.S. military's uh, line in, in, in shaping public opinion throughout the Middle East and Central Asia mm-hmm. uh, with like anti-Russia, anti-Iran, pro-U.S. military messages just given through like fake accounts and, and fake news sites. And I was fascinated by this because it's like, okay, this is the one It's just interesting on its own, but also interesting in the context of how we've talked about fake news and foreign-backed influence operations Oh, it's, it's like, okay, this is what they accuse Russia and other countries of doing to us. Mm-hmm. We're doing it to them too. Mm-hmm. That doesn't justify, but it's just kind of, it provides, yeah. I think, important context that I think a lot of Americans forget or yeah. at least don't know, you know? So I had done some interviews. I had kind of looked at some of the documents. And so that was one of the first kind of things on my mind when I went into the Twitter office. Um, I, 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 I found emails that not only confirmed Twitter's participation in this Pentagon CENTCOM influence operation, but actually showed so much more. So like back in 2017, literally the same months that Twitter was going to Congress, telling the intelligence committees and other committees, look, you know, that, you know, this is 2017. So the, the previous year, the Russian influence in the presidential election, that was wrong. And we're going to have a whole new team set up to identify any kind of government state backed influence operation, you know, creating fake accounts to influence the public opinion, public discourse, and we're going to identify them, we're going to shut them down, and then we're going to publish transparency reports showing what's going on. Mm-hmm. We're going to be, you know, great at, at, at spotting and shutting these things down. At the same time, they were Twitter executives were meeting with the Pentagon and uh, creating a, a special uh, bot, basically. They, they call it a bot, but it's basically an addition to the, tw- to the Pentagon's accounts uh, that gave them blue check benefits. So it means when you back in the day before Elon, if you had a, a verified blue check, that actually made you a little bit more visible. You were mm-hmm. more likely to trend. You couldn't be flagged as spam. Um, it just gave you lots of other little kind of invisible benefits. So they went the they the, in 2017. Twitter was working with CENTCOM and they created a blue an invisible blue check for their network of accounts. So they would be more likely to trend, more like they could post NSFW content without being flagged as spam. Uh, all these accounts went dark, meaning some of them in the beginning had little disclosures saying this is this is controlled by CENTCOM. That disappeared. They, they started being identified as, you know, normal guy in Yemen, guy in, uh, you know, news account. That it was f- really got, some guy in the Pentagon. Yeah, really yeah. someone in CENTCOM at, at their Tampa headquarters. Mm. Um, Manipulating these accounts. That was, like, you know, like posting pro-U.S. material or, or maybe pro-Saudi material or... Yeah, like talking a lot... Anti-Iran material. Exactly. Talking a lot about... Um, a lot of anti-Iran messages, um, stuff about the Yemen war that was going on at, at the time, uh, messages around Syria and, and, and in Iraq, uh, posting certain links that were favorable to the U.S. military kind of uh, agenda there. And, you know, this was going on, and Twitter was pr- basically providing concierge service uh, for the, the Pentagon. And this went on for years. Um, it was not until uh, 2022 that they kind of started winding this down. I, I think because they got s- some discovery, some of these kind of uh, dis- disinfo groups had, had, had realized their existence. And even in the course of, of the, the late stages of this Pentagon campaign, they were working with Twitter saying like, okay, here's the list of our accounts. Here's another list of our accounts. How do we set up this in a way that if we wind them down, we aren't discovered? Because they thought if they mm. delete them, did a mass deletion at the same time, people would realize that there was right. something funny going on. And so, what wasn't even a point where they were trying to classify it retroactively? Yeah. So, you know, we don't know all the details of this, but it's fascinating. You know, we have this in Washington uh, issue of Overclassification. I think this applies. There was, I think, Pentagon officials realized how sensitive this was, and they demanded all kinds of levels of classification for Twitter executives to either fly to D.C. or meet in San Francisco, 
and, and, and talk about this, and they wanted to retroactively classify all the discussions just to make sure this never leaked out. Mm-hmm. So because, you know, the Pentagon just kind of saw the political sensitivities around this issue. And there, you saw you publicized an email where someone at Twitter is saying, I think they're trying to overclassify this because they're embarrassed by it. Yeah, right? yeah. So, I, I, you know, that, that they, they understood the implications. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, okay, so, you know, do you have any sense of how effective any of these sort of psyops, social media psyops were? I mean, was it, is it, uh, is part of the embarrassment how bad the U.S. security state is at creating social media misinformation or let's say strategic information? Or is it, do you think this stuff like has an impact in the Middle East? Well, look, from just like following this misinformation, disinformation campaign, a lot of this goes back to the Arab Spring. You know, Hillary Clinton was very vocal about this, but so many others who are in the national security state apparatus at the State Department, at the Pentagon, saw the power of Facebook and other social media platforms in creating revolutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when they kind of started really expanding the money they spent in studying this phenomenon and developing it and, and, and like looking at technology to control bot networks that shape it, public opinion. Was this particular... And so there's been a there's been a um, an understanding of the potential effects of, of this of influence operations of mass social media efforts to shape a whole country's opinion to get people to rise up where they normally would not rise up to engage in violence perhaps where they wouldn't get engage in violence. Um, social media is very powerful. Hmm. Um, was this particular Pentagon effort? I mean, were they effective? I I really have no idea. You know, I, you look at some of the sites; they were kind of claiming that. Iranians were harvesting the organs of Afghan refugees and, you know, kind of spreading the kind of um, nasty stories that, you, you know, that that like Russians, it's, it's such an equivalent to what Russians were doing uh, to the U.S. on some some level. But I think just like the uh, some of these Russian influence operations, they didn't seem particularly effective. I, I my, my gut feeling is that a lot of these Pentagon operations probably weren't terribly effective, but it, it's hard for me to judge. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm curious, is like you have you have a lot of stories which highlight, you know, the, the FBI, you know, the FBI's meddling in our lives in way that in ways that many people don't realize, right? Like the FBI hiring private contractors to get accepted into like Discord communities and, and message boards and you know, like the the avatar online that's acting weird in some invite only social media context might be a spy sort of paid by the FBI. So can you talk a little bit about what, what is up with that? Well, I'm interested in this subset of the cybersecurity industry known as the threat intelligence industry. It's very specialized uh, but there, you know, despite the term cybersecurity, which you might attribute to like, oh, okay, you're, you're talking about passwords or authentication. This is actually kind of a surveillance side of the cybersecurity world where they go into the dark corners of the Internet, the dark net, you know, these big Discord chat groups, you know, private Reddits, that type of thing. They look for what they call threat actors. Now, a lot of the times that's, that's hackers, that's potential terrorists, that's even activists um, and they they create fake identities online that gain the trust of the forum admins so they can get invited into these private spaces where normally we have very little visibility. They research the conversations. They kind of ingratiate themselves into these communities, and they sell intelligence reports back to corporations and to the government. Now, the FBI contra- contracts with a lot of these firms. You know, I just did a two-part series looking at some of them, um, you know, uh, one of the big firms, uh, Zero Fox, you know, they, they kind of got sucked into the news cycle because the FBI actually switched from a different firm to them just in the days before January 6th. And they hadn't learned how to use all their, t- uh, tools. So they felt like that, that actually created a, a security gap where it's just the timing was kind of weird mm. where normally they would have had better surveillance of extremist right-wing groups. Um, but yeah, this this provide this is a, a another kind of I think gray area 
uh, for the Fourth Amendment. You know, normally you need a warrant to look at private communications. If I'm in a private chat with you or mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in a group um, with an online component where it's, you know, invite only, you know, the government has no role there. You know, they, they need a warrant to get get those communications. But this is, has historically been the area where there's there's been a role for private spies, private contractors, and for confidential um, informants. You know, the FBI has a very long history of using informants to get into groups to gather information where they don't necessarily have a warrant, where there isn't kind of pro- probable cause. It's this very kind of gray area where they can engage in intimate surveillance of um, political organizations, um, and often people who are just, um, you know, in- involved in any kind of group that's seen as potentially dangerous, even if they're exercising their First Amendment rights. Uh, the, the FBI has, has incredible resources at its disposal. This is one of them. And, you know, the, the, this threat intelligence industry, you know, in, in the stories I, I published recently on my Substack, you know, it's it's not clear who they're doing this surveillance for. In, in, in some cases, you know, like they they could be doing this for the FBI. They could be doing it for a private corporation that wants the insights into, you know, activists or groups they see as adversarial. It's not perfectly clear, but it is clear from public contracts that, that these firms do work for the FBI. Is there a deep state? You know, this is a term that is fraught because it depends who you're talking to. Everyone has different um, definitions of the term, but broadly speaking, is there kind of a permanent um, bureaucracy made up of uh, government officials and private contractors uh, that have disproportionate control over foreign and domestic security policy? Um, and are unresponsive to electoral pressure, democracy, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. It's just, you know, it's I'm, I'm only nervous about the term because you can t- obviously take it too far. Mm-hmm. You can make assumptions. You know, I just I just think, you know, if you're talking about anything in politics, you know, even terms like identity politics, you know, people have different meanings that it, they attribute to them. Just go on what's known. And there's already a lot of crazy stuff that happens that where we have evidence, we have a history. Uh, let, let's talk about that. Don't I think people are, are too quick to take leaps hmm. when they hear a term like that. Yeah. Um, what does the FBI have against vegans? <laughs> well, um, I've done a lot of this reporting because I find it fascinating. Um, the FBI has, in many of its field offices, uh, famously in Sacramento and, and in Des Moines, uh, where I've done s- some reporting, they're very close to animal ag interests. And animal ag interests view vegan activists as a threat. You know, it used to be the case that groups like Mercy for Animals and others would infiltrate factory farms and slaughterhouses and document um, what they say is the inhumane treatment of animals, and then they would disclose that and, you know, engage in activism around it. And more recently, we have groups like Direct Action Everywhere that, you know, from their perspective, they're taking a page from MLK and they're engaging in civil disobedience, going and shutting down slaughterhouses and rescuing animals and kind of engaging in political theatrics to bring uh, attention to to their demands. Mm -hmm. Uh, Animal Ag, uh, understandably, is is very upset about this. And in addition to fighting these groups directly, they've reached out to the FBI and encouraged them to view uh, activist groups such as Direct Action Everywhere and other vegans as terrorists. Um, they've enlisted kind of the security state uh, as an ally in cracking down on these organizations. So are vegan are there vegan groups that are trying to harm human beings as a mode of raising awareness? I'm not aware of that. You know, yeah. I, I've, there's that bit... would seem to be my personal definition of terrorism. Sure. Yeah, like if you're if you're if you're trespassing to get a video of a factory farm, that's not terrorism. It's illegal, but it's not terrorism, really, right? Yeah, I mean, one of these me- FBI field memos that I obtained and reported recently, you know, they make a lot of leaps, in my opinion. And uh, not just in my opinion. I mean, they're, they're factually wrong in the, in the memo uh, to make the argument that these vegan activists are terrorists. And, and one, this one memo that I'm talking about, they say that 
that's with the FBI's Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate. They're saying these vegans are a bioterror threat because in one of these direct actions, they went into a poultry farm. You know, the point of this action was, you know, this, this one poultry farm claimed that their eggs are cage-free, and they wanted to expose that they're not cage-free. These animals are kept in cages under what they describe as unsanitary and inhumane conditions. And so in exposing this, you know, the FBI said, okay, well, they these groups did not uh, wear any biosafety measures. They didn't wear gloves and, and gowns. And so by going in and taking this action, they could spread these poultry-borne diseases, like Newcastle's disease. And this is a disease that only affects chickens and other poultry. Um, so they're, they're a bioterrorism threat. And this, if you, if you read the FBI memo, it's, it's cited, it's cited. So it's got a little, um, it's got a citation. And if you follow the, the link that, that even the FBI cites in its own memo, and you read this, the local press story of this action, it says that the activists wore full body suits and gloves and did use, it's like, okay, the FBI did not even like they're, 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 they're using this very inflammatory rhetoric. They're mm-hmm. distributing this memo to all, you know, Northern California law enforcement. So if you're law enforcement and the FBI is saying this is a bioterrorist threat, this is a, a potential terror group. I mean, I think it would be your job to, to, to view these groups as a potential terror threat. The, the memo's own justification is not there, you know? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, they're taking it, in, I think, an inappropriate relationship with animal ag industry, um, really being recruited to, to go after these groups. And they're doing it in a... In a um, in a way that that seems very inappropriate. Have you ever felt that the FBI is aware of you? Uh, look, I've you know, um, I did a stories on FBI contractors back in 2011, based on some hacked documents. There's you know, back then, Anonymous was a big hacker mm-hmm. organization, and they had hacked some security contractors, some surveillance firms. And looking through those emails back in 2011, I saw my own stories that they were concerned about. Mm. So it's like, okay, that doesn't take that many steps to see that maybe there's some potential surveillance there. Mm-hmm. For the agency itself, you know, I, I have no idea. You're not – has – I mean, because I can picture being an investigative journalist who is focused on security state overreach and civil liberties – I can see that making a person paranoid or cynical, right? Like when you're always dealing with these ways in which, for lack of a better term, Big Brother is watching way more than you think, I can see how one could become a person that looks over their shoulder a little a little more often. Do you think that's happened to you at all, or have you managed to stay like level-headed throughout all your years? Well, you know, I just don't I don't want to engage in any kind of like vilification or like unfair journalism. I'm reporting some abuses. I you know, uh I I kind of look across the world and look at how how journalists are treated there. I've done some reporting in Honduras and met journalists whose colleagues were killed mm-hmm. by you know, police and by, you know, um powerful, you know, interests there that they upset. And you know, the U.S. has a lot of problems, but we do a very good job in protecting journalists. And there's a very low levels relatively, you know, compared to the rest of the world of political violence, mm-hmm. uh, you know, especially towards journalists. I mean, there are some exceptions there, but they're pretty low. And I just want to look at any kind of issue with 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 context, you know, like. So when even when I, I apply it to myself, I think the the risk and danger levels are low. That being said, yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm a little bit paranoid. Yeah. Yeah, this I mean, this gets to a question I think I was asked in a and a recently, which is how do I view U.S. military power abroad? And my view is that inherently we are not better than most other militaries. But what we what we can say is that our military is far more accountable to the press because we have a free press. So when our military commits atrocities abroad and at home, which it does, the likelihood it comes out and the public cares about it is higher here than in any other major power on earth, certainly Russia and China. And that check 
tends to make our the consequences of U.S. power globally better than the consequences of Russian power, Chinese power, etc. That's kind of my view. What is your view of of um, U.S. Because this, in, to put it in context, there is a perpetual debate about isolationism on the one hand. Let's just, you know, let's take our, our, our military, stop, stop these forever wars and just, you know, focus on writing the ship at home versus the view that if we remove ourselves from the global stage, that creates a power vacuum into which worse people come. Yeah, I, I, well, these are kind of two different arguments. It's the kind of vacuum effect. If the U.S. pulls back, then China, Russia, perhaps other authoritarian governments expand. And in that gap, um, you see more of their military activity. You know, I, I have some problems with this theory because that is the kind of logic of the Cold War that was used to justify a lot of violence um, and in some cases kind of exaggerate the threat of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you know, I, I, I do trust the U.S. military more, by far more uh, than Russia or, or China for the reasons that uh, you mentioned. Um, but I, I don't see it as kind of like this, this polar thing. You know, there, there are a lot of other militaries, like I, the most Western, Northern European press is much more aggressive than ours, mm. you know, and has done a better job at spotlighting human rights abuses. We have a mixed record. You know, I think there are a lot of atrocities, human rights abuses that have been committed, particularly in Afghanistan. And the, the, we, we, we engage not on the ground level, but with supplying um, the weapons and doing kind of the reconnaissance and intelligence work for the Saudi for Saudi Arabia and their invasion of, of Yemen, um, a conflict that's killed thousands of children, left hundreds of thousands, uh, you know, without a home. I, I don't see any reporting on that at mm -hmm. all, like except for a few um, niche media outlets. You know, I, I think the, the again, if, the issue here is that, for that. Uh, it's, it's not U.S. soldiers on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of this conflict somewhere else with American allies and weapons and money, but it's, you know, it's it's maybe too esoteric. Um, it's in a very poor, it's, you know, Yemen's the poorest country in the Middle East, poorest mm -hmm. Arab country, and perhaps that's part of it too. I, I'm not sure. You know, it does, isn't seen as like an, an important hotspot in the world. So, you know, it's, it's mixed. You know, there, and there's a lot of human rights abuses that have been committed by the U.S. military and its allies in Afghanistan during the occupation there that I don't think received a, a ton of press. Though big picture, what you're saying, you know, about China and Russia, yeah, I, I think that's, that's right. One of my other takes here is that when we are choosing between presidents, we spend not enough time on foreign policy and too much time on domestic policy because the president has kind of carte blanche over foreign policy but has – a million veto points and checks yes. with what he or she would want to do domestically. And you basically see every president's domestic policy gets like 80% thwarted and maybe, maybe 20% accomplished. Whereas their perspective on foreign policy and their experience and competence on foreign policy translates directly into actions. Like wars start and stop as a result of particular presidents coming to power. Um, I'm curious if you if you share that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm frustrated at the media by this. I mean, there's kind of it's like the I, I can guarantee the 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 next presidential debates they're going to be talking about like wokeness and what the president wants to do with wokeness as if he or she has power to just like end or you know continue wokeness, but there will be relatively little, maybe no conversation about Yemen, right? Where actually the next president could just like fundamentally change things. That's right. right. And no, I, I completely agree. I mean, part of it's just our, the, the bigger problems with profit driven media, you know, maybe it's chicken or egg. If, if they think that the audience doesn't care about it, they mm -hmm. won't ask it. Mm -hmm. But then if they don't ask it, then of course the audience doesn't <laughs> care about it. Right. So it's like this kind of negative feedback loop of, of ignorance. That being said, yeah, like the you know, it's the it's not just war. It's you know this the the president controls this 
gigantic infrastructure of bases of special forces of you know clandestine operations all over the world and congress has little if no oversight of what it does so yeah no no veto points um the supreme court doesn't really intervene on this issue so again no no veto points there Mm -hmm. and yeah i I think it's kind of better I think the security state or the deep state or the blob even prefers it this way, that it's not a, 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 a you know, mm-hmm. the, the kind of questions we do get are, you know, we, we I think the, the the media in many ways has drifted to the left on social issues. You know, if I'm going to make a sweeping statement, but on foreign policy, it's still kind of you, the questions that you do hear are very jingoistic. You know, just even that. You might li- even say it's drifted to the right. Yeah, perhaps it's drifted to the right. Like even. The Trump town hall uh, on CNN, which is kind of like this proto 2024 event, mm-hmm. um, perhaps the very first one of the Republican primaries, the the CNN host, I, I'm blanking on her name, but she asked Trump about what he would do on, on the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm-hmm. But the framing was just fascinating. I mean, it just it, it sounded like something from an 80s you know, war movie. It's like, d- do you support Ukraine winning? Do you, are you going to support Ukraine winning this war? It's like you, you're framing this as, as a win-lose thing when, you know, I, it's not clear if that's even in the U.S. interest if, if one side dominates the other, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, or in, the, in in either side's interest. I mean, why is it always about who wins and dominates a conflict? That's, you know, this kind of very war-friendly, uh, military-friendly focus of a conflict that should probably be negotiated and ended very soon. Yeah. So, yeah, we should talk a little bit about about Russia, Ukraine, because there is this rift between people who basically feel that the the only position to take is the pro-Ukrainian position and policy wise to support them as much as possible until they win. That a Ukrainian full victory is the only acceptable resolution to the conflict. And then there is an opposing position, which was expressed by realists like John Mearsheimer and many others that says, look, Russia is one of the great powers in the world. Unfortunately, great powers often get what they want more often. And to insist on Russia's complete and total loss may be to court a human rights catastrophe on a scale that is so unacceptable that we have to we have to allow for the Ukrainians to lose something too. Right. And and try to midwife that the the ending of this conflict in a way that some Ukrainians may not be completely happy with. Right. So how do you feel about that issue and how the media has treated it? Because I can see I mean, I can see both sides of it in in different moods. But, um, yeah, I put that to you. Yeah. I mean, this entire conflict has been stilted. You don't. We should see a diversity of opinion about this conflict. We mm-hmm. really see kind of a monolithic. You, you, why isn't the U.S. doing more to supply arms? Why are those arms not more arms? You know, like why aren't they? You know, F six. If there's Abram tanks, why aren't they F sixteens? You know, if if they're F sixteens, why aren't they other? You know, long range ballistic missiles. You know, it's like um, there there isn't just a there aren't prominent voices that are talking about a diplomatic solution to this conflict. And, you know, generally speaking, I don't know if you saw this controversy from last year. I just found it fascinating. Um, The House Progressive Caucus, this is the Mm -hmm. most left-wing group of congressional members, wanted to put together a letter. The letter simply was was going to be sent to the, the president, to Biden, saying that we should at least be pushing for a more you know, negotiated end to this conflict. It shouldn't only be based on weapons and, and winning more territory back. Uh, and as soon as news got out that they were circulating this letter and, you know, gathering signatures before sending it to Biden, it blew up. It's all the um, members started pointing at each other, saying that they got duped by this letter. Mm-hmm. They were all, no one would, would take responsibility for this letter. And the context of the letter was quite reasonable. It was not in any way pro-Russia or no. anti-Ukraine. It was just kind of gently suggesting that we try to midwife a resolution that's it yeah and 
you know, you saw the law- lawmakers who had just even signed it. And when they saw, when the, when the news of the letter leaked, you have this kind of huge mass of Ukraine partisans all throughout the world, but particularly in Western Europe and in the U.S., where they shout down and accuse anyone of who supports a diplomatic solution of being a Putin stooge or they're funded by Russia. And that and, and all these Democratic members who I, I would kind of assume a lot of these are, are members that represent suburban, well-to-do suburban districts. Mm-hmm. People like Jamie Raskin in, in Maryland represents Montgomery County. Um, you know, then looking at the letter and saying, you know, I, of course I would not sign a letter that, so that is friendly to Russia, which is a sexist, transphobic country, you know, kind of like... like As opposed the, to Ukraine, which is probably totally pro Exactly. Like, taking like a U.S. <laughs> lens on social issues, then applying it to this debate to kind of justify their own, like, backtracking. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, it went poof. And, you know, talking to... I talked to different congressional staff mm-hmm. who, who worked on this issue, and they were saying, yeah, it wasn't some kind of... Actually, in this case, it was not the deep state or the blob who intimidated all these lawmakers from signing this letter. It's just the media environment, seeing all these social media and news stories, even hinting that they were maybe more open to a resolution and therefore pro, you know, pro peace with Russia, you know, that's what scared them. Uh, That's what made them back off. So it just kind of speaks to the overall media environment that it's just so hostile to you know this this idea that you know Mir- Mearsheimer has has laid it out. That's like, look, this 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 isn't going to be a, a storybook ending. Probably, you know, it's going to be. You know, Russia is a great power. Um, they are willing to to fight uh, for a very long time uh, for their their chunk of what they see as as a buffer zone between them and, and NATO. Um, yeah, uh, this this conflict probably won't be won militarily. I mean, you, you see these mm-hmm. these claims about how Ukraine c- can break out and take back Crimea and you know um, make other territorial gains, uh, you know, on CNN and MSNBC on a regular basis. And it's just it's it seems unhealthy for our society that we we don't have a more robust and diverse discussion looking at the, at the issues of, of, a, of a negotiated settlement i mean at the end of the day this is over um you know a region of, of russia that or a, a region of ukraine that uh has been you know it's it's been separatist for a very long time because of cultural language related issues um it it, it, it seems very complicated and and you know I, I don't know the domestic politics of ukraine we kind of only see uh the kind of Pro Zelensky, pro government side. I, I just wonder what the U- Ukrainian people think of this. I mean, they're the ones who are suffering the most in this conflict. I, I, mm-hmm. You know, you don't hear their perspective either on these conflicts. I think if you look at any kind of military engagement around the world, you you tend to see these these like, you know, pundits who are tied to the the military or funded by a defense contractor. You see politicians who are very jingoistic. But you don't actually hear from any of the, the the people who are most affected by this conflict. See, my my position is I'd never want to equivocate on who is really most to blame, which I feel is Russia and Putin. But even granting that this is a war of aggression for which Putin is primarily responsible, and you know, r- regardless of you know the mistakes the West made and NATO made. He's, at the end of the day, the guy that chose to launch this war and f- somehow can sleep at night knowing that he's he's made this choice. Uh, even still, we should... W- I don't think America should have exactly the same position as Ukraine. Uh, like, like it, Ukrainians who feel we, we need to win back every inch of our country, that's perfectly understandable because it's their country that was invaded... We, I think the U.S.'s role should be to support them while also making some of our support contingent on them being willing to concede something for peace talks, right? Like this is how we've done, we've done this with Israel in the past in, in particular wars and we've done this w- with w- w- where, where you make aid contingent on the side you're supporting conceding something and being willing to come to, to, the, to peace talks, right? And they never want to do it because they want to win back every inch, but our position should not be the same as theirs, right? Yeah, I mean, the suspicion, and not such so much of a suspicion, because there are 
prominent members of the Biden administration. And by the way, that might be happening in back channels that like we are not privy to. I certainly hope it is. But well, we haven't seen any. Yeah, we haven't seen any public demands that any of this aid or any of these weapons are contingent on negotiations. Definitely not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would hope that it is going on. I, I share that view. It's just like if you've if you've aired this on if you aired that view on um, a more prominent platform if you're on CNN say I, this. I've been going on CNN actually uh, if, if it comes up I will say that please say that <laughs> I, I, would, I would look at the kind of response because you know you're going to be kind of unpersoned or it's stigmatized as like a pro-Russia you know vo- voice uh, funded by by Russia uh-huh. it's, it's just it's not a healthy debate but you know I we I think everyone would benefit just from this view um, even if it's not the right view, we should, it should be at least part of the mix. We haven't seen it debated in Congress, really. We haven't seen it debated in the media, uh, but it's clearly something that's lacking. Okay, so let's see. Two more topics I want to touch with you before I let you go. Um, one is uh, something I talked with Noam Chomsky about when I had him on my podcast maybe two years ago at this point. This was at the height of BLM protests and we talked about this notion of a corporate woke, which is the strange phenomenon whereby multinational, powerful corporations around 2020 and in years leading up, for some strange reason, all it seemed like all the CEOs read Robin D'Angelo and just like were like really like I agree with this. Yeah. Um, at least they pretended to be like super into Kendi and Coates and wokeness. Uh, uh, while at the same time being the ruthless, profit-hungry corporations that we all know that they are, in an earlier era, this would have made simply no sense, right? Because the 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 whole ethos of wokeness would have been anti-multinational corporations. But it seems there there was this strange marriage where you had all of these huge corporations donating to BLM, which turned out to be a fraud, which is a whole other story. But... Um, and, and this, I think, reflects the rift that you had with the the intercept to to some degree, which is how do you view wokeness in an age where wokeness has, to a large extent, held hands with corporate power. Well, that's. That's, I think, at the crux of my problem with wokeness. I mean, there are other problems, and it just makes people a little bit too deterministic about why we have public policy issues. It kind of raises the, what I would call a disparity fallacy, looking at any disparity and then assuming that there's racial intent. But in, in my reporting, which kind of animates me, is that when I look, I, I do a lot of writing about how special interests and corporate interests manufacture public opinion in support of their lobbying priorities that are selfish, that are just benefiting their, their company, often at, at, at the expense of the public interest. Mm-hmm. Wokeness, for lack of a better term, is a public relations tactic. It's a way for corporations to shape public opinion without sacrificing any of their bottom line. In fact, I'd say that they deploy it in a way that advances their bottom line, that that enriches their shareholders that makes it less likely and more difficult to tax these companies to enhance regulations or labor policy that they might that might cost them more money and there are endless examples um here in california it's you know this is a strategy that works among democratic or left-leaning voters because they're more sympathetic to these arguments so Mm -hmm. we're here in california in california this is just well before 2020 and the floyd protests this is a tried and true tactic you know, when organizers put a ballot measure together to lower prescription drug prices, 2016, um, Big Pharma came in. And, you know, if you're a Big Pharma, if you're Pfizer, or, you know, what have you, you know, you, you might not be seen as very sympathetic to the in the eyes of voters, mm-hmm. especially for this initiative that would lower your, your potential profits. Uh, so what they did was they funded LGBT groups, the NAACP, Asian and Latino groups to go out and be their front and represent them in, in this ballot initiative and said that, you know, this ballot measure, I mean, really in the most disingenuous terms and almost nonsensical terms that this would, you know, 
somehow harm the Medicaid reimbursements and that because more minorities are on Medicaid, this would hurt minorities. I mean, none of this was, was factual or true, but they were being paid and these organizations went out and helped Big Pharma successfully defeat this drug price lowering initiative. And wow. the same thing's been, the same thing's true is about with, with, with Uber, you know, Uber and Lyft had, a, a, there was a, a state law here uh, that would have given Uber drivers uh, state minimum wage, allow them to organize as employees. Right now they're classified as independent contractors. Whether you agree or not with this dynamic, uh, what's fascinating are the political tactics used to destroy it. Uber put over $100 million, uh, along with Lyft, into a, an account that was used to fund um, uh, organizations like the Asian American uh, Coalition, uh, NAACP, that, that claimed that this initiative, that these laws that would have given workers a state minimum wage and the, and the opportunity to organize their own unions was racist. And again, it, this worked. Voters in a year that overwhelmingly went for, for Biden mm -hmm. also rejected and, and supported Uber's position that then revoked this part of uh, California law that would have given drivers more labor rights. So, you know, this is a strategy for a lot of companies, not just to advance public policy, but to enhance their public image. You know, mm -hmm. if they're engaging in some kind of behavior or activity that is unpopular, one way for any of these banks to, to these corporations or banks or what have you to, to pivot is they, they, they point out their donations to BLM during that mm -hmm. summer, or they, they show the racial diversity of their corporate board. How this actually affects their customers or society at large is unclear to me, but this is based for the corporations using identity politics. This is a mental shortcut. This is a way for their liberal antagonists and you know, in the media or in the public to then say, oh, no, wait, you know, this, this is a company that cares about social justice, about racial justice, and they will ignore um, whatever other behavior that companies engaging in. Yeah, no, I, th I think this is pretty clear. What struck me as so, uh, so toxic in 2020 was that you had you know, black people and women saying, I need to be on a corporate board, right? And, you know, th these are people that already make seven figures, right? I need to be on a corporate board because this guy, George Floyd, was murdered in Minneapolis. And because we're the same skin color, I should get even richer than I already am. And that's a way of doing justice to him. Right. And, and this isn't this wasn't called greed or avarice. This is called noble social justice. Right. Meanwhile, my pockets get fatter. This seemed to me to be such a cynical dynamic. Like, can we be honest about what's happening? This is pure opportunism and self-interest masquerading as helping the world yeah it's i mean that's what it seems like to me i least. mean that there are just countless countless examples of this yeah we're talking about people that if they saw george floyd at night would cross the street right <laughs> yeah and the moment he's murdered they say well i need to be on a corporate board because we're the same skin color and you know you gotta do something right it's it's opportunity it's like standing on a man's grave and fattening your pockets uh, I, th I think there's something really slimy about that to me. Yeah, no, I, I, it's extremely slimy to me, too. And you, you saw this on an interpersonal level, people kind of getting ahead in their own institutions and mm -hmm. in academia and in the media, uh, kind of taking advantage of this moment. And, you know, I, I just when you're, when you're talking about that, I, I, I just it reminds me of how much of crude racial identity politics is a way to kind of paper over our bigger divisions in society that are very real, which are, I think, our class divisions. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of poor people in this country. Um, a lot of them are white. A lot of them are not even people of color. There are tens of millions of, of white people living in poverty in this country that desperately need help. I mean, we're the wealthiest country in the world, and we do have, we have very poor health outcomes for low income. If you look at our overcrowded prisons, um, you know, people obsessed over the, the, the racial dynamics, but these are mostly poor people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you look at uh, our underinvestments in infrastructure and, and education. Again, this basically cuts on, on, on class more than race. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in a way, just on a kind of personal psychological level to avoid these tough discussions, because addressing a, a class divide requires the investment of resources. It means giving up resources for a lot of people, too, in terms of higher taxes or um, – better um, 
better kind of planned uh, uh, social welfare programs, um, which would cut out a lot of private contractors that, that take up a little bit of this bloat. Um, rather than addressing any of this, we can engage in this kind of theatrical, superficial identity politics where you make performative acts that actually don't address any of these root problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, around poverty and the corporate boards are, are the I think I think the best example of this because it's 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 crazy to see these companies you, look, you, you know any of your listeners can google which companies have done the best in diversifying their boards mm-hmm. it's like I, I, I this this is a report that's a few years old but I, I, if you do this google search you can find it it's like you know some financial services companies including debt collectors uh, you know pharma companies it's like mm-hmm. these companies that are just Harassing poor people. Yeah, but, and like and, and ripping off the worry, taxpayer. Don't worry, we have enough women and black people on our board. It's it's astounding. <laughs> I I did a story on the ESG report of uh, Corrections Corp, this massive private mm. prison company, and you know they they st- they did this they produced this report saying that they deserve a higher ESG score. Can you tell people what an ESG score is? Um, so it's it used to be called socially responsible investing. It came out of like the eighties and nineties, this effort to kind of nudge, create kind of like a a scorecard that encourages corporations to engage in better business practices that reflect human rights and and other concerns and environmental concerns being a big one. So, you know, broad, broad strokes doesn't seem that bad. seems like maybe perhaps a good, good movement. Um, but what ESG has now become, uh, the big wealth, Asset managers of the world, companies like BlackRock mm-hmm. and others, they create index funds and they market it to socially conscious investors, liberals uh, with a lot of money. Uh, and they say, if you invest with us, you know, you're helping change the world, fix the world. And, and now it's like a, a gazillion different categories. Um, th- there's a big emphasis now on race. Uh, yeah. and, and in order for a company to qualify for that, they would have to have a diverse board, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. one of the metrics. But, you know, if you actually drill down on these ESG reports and these rating agencies that give the numbers out, it's completely arbitrary. None of it makes any sense. It's all self-reported jumbo. Yeah. Like I, I, I talked to a, one CEO for one ESG story I, I did, and, you know, he might present as white, mm-hmm. um, but he is a quarter non-white. Mm-hmm. And so he thought, okay, to get a better ESG score, I'm now a minority. Uh-huh. And so for his ESG report, he put he is a diverse CEO. I mean, it's like all these things are, are so subjective and silly. Mm-hmm. And that gave him a better, a better score. It's like, are, are you actually helping society with any of this ESG stuff? Mm-hmm. And then like, we, don't, we haven't even got into like the whole aspect of how this is kind of like a scam. Like you have a huge cottage industry of ESG consultants that help juice the numbers and create these glossy reports. Even when companies pollute more, they can manage ways to like – uh, have a better pollution score for their ESG rep- reports. Um, Bloomberg has done a great series on this stuff. Mm. Um, MSCI is the big rating agency. And in, in addition to that, it's like if you're an investor and you're putting your money into an ESG index fund, you're paying higher fees. And then you actually look at the portfolio companies of these index, of these ES, pro ESG funds. They're essentially identical to the non ESG ones. You're just paying a higher fee, you know, as, as an, an wow. investor. It's like, who is this for? Am I right that uh, Vivek Ramaswamy has been, uh, has in some way led the charge on like anti ESG investing? Yeah, I mean he's, you know, I think we have a little bit of a different take on it though. Like I, oh. I'm, I'm, I, I don't know many left wingers other than myself and a few others that criticize this stuff. Mm-hmm. Most, most of the conservative critiques are different, you know. Vivek and others have said that, you know, this is an effort to, like, engage in social engineering of the country through one. ESG. I know that one of their critiques is, like, for example, if if I have a pension fund, if I've been paying into a pension fund, my pension fund might be ESG-ified, whether or not that reflects the values of, like, the employees yeah. at the company, right? Well, that's a long-running pension issue that's yeah. even beyond ESG, but now ESG can – it's like – Deep states, like getting applied a little bit too liberally, yeah. Because because you know pension funds for state employee workers, whether you're in New York or California or wherever, they're inherently political. I mean, the, mm-hmm. you have an elected board that makes the big decisions with the state investment agency, and 
oftentimes, given the composition of these boards, they make political choices. They say, hey, we're not we're not going to invest in any gun companies. We're not going to invest in, in mm-hmm. tobacco companies. That was a big thing in the 90s mm-hmm. for the California pension funds. Uh, does it even work? Did that stop any gun violence? Uh, uh, I don't I don't know. I, I, don't, I think mm-hmm. that the, the jury... I'm not even sure if the jury's still out. There's been a couple papers showing that this does not work, that it doesn't actually shape that much corporate policy. Um, these, these big pension fund kind of... There's, there's very showy, like, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to take our money out of a certain type of company. I mean, I, I don't know if that works. Is that ESG? Yeah, it's like the same mindset as, as ESG, but it's not technically ESG, I think, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, last question. Do you see artificial intelligence influencing anything about your work? Um, anything about, uh, I mean, it, it seems to me AI can help hackers in some way and that this might have an effect on a journalist like yourself that often deals with hacked materials and um and so have you seen ai's recent advances as in any way affecting your work in a, in a couple ways yes I, I haven't felt the effects yet one i think it's going to improve me as a journalist i do everything i mean i shouldn't say everything i do so much digitally you know i, I cover dc i cover politics and I do a lot of research. I'm, I'm like scraping websites and creating little, you know, alerts for when websites update. I'm looking at digital courtroom dockets, at business filings, at, you know, various other disclosures that are out in the world and trying to come up with story ideas based on these documents that are just floating around the Internet. Mm. And if I can use AI as a tool, I think I can be more effective in reporting them. Um, can it supercharge? Uh, it's, it, it will supercharge, you know, government surveillance and other you know, areas where there could be, you know, areas of abuse. I'd like to report on that. Just like mm-hmm. as AI is being applied to different areas of the economy, I think there are, you know, unintended consequences that are going to be very interesting for journalists to pick apart. And then finally, I think, you know, I, I this is kind of just me guessing here. I have no idea. But, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of concerns around this is a kind of industrial revolution type moment Mm -hmm. we'll see over the next few years that disproportionately affects upper income you know highly professional workers that there will be less you know won't replace lawyers but it'll make lawyer the legal teams more tight like one lawyer can do the work of maybe two and a half lawyers in a few years and Mm -hmm. same goes for designers and engineers and other uh, you know highly educated professions and you look at the history of social movements and revolutions they tend to be actually led by the highly educated. Mm. When the highly educated feel uh, vulnerable and affected, they go out and radicalize much faster than a blue collar worker would. And so, you know, comparing this to, you know, containerization and deindustrialization in the 80s, where it was mostly blue collar, you know, car and steel manufacturing workers and that, you know, their jobs were shipped overseas, they didn't really revolt. A lot of them kind of that uh, uh, highly affected the politics of the 80s and 90s in, ter- in terms of crime and you know all the kind of spillover effects of deindustrialization i'm wondering about the spillover effects of ai with all these highly educated workers mm. potentially being displaced are they going to what are they going to do i think that's just as an observer as someone who covers politics and and, and issues in society that's going to be fascinating because i don't think they're going to take it lightly mm. okay lee fong Thanks so much for coming on my show. And before I let you go, just one more plug for for your Substack. www.leafong.com. All right. Awesome. Thank Thanks you for Lee. having me. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.